Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is, can you hear me okay? Um, My name is Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank everybody that's uh, a part of this conference for having Barbara and me here. Cynthia was the first one that um, I think somebody else contacted me, but Cynthia has been in close contact with me from almost from day one and picked us up at the airport. And I, I appreciate that, Cynthia, and I'm hopeful she's going to take us back. <coughs> you know, this I, I get to a few number, a few of these conferences, and I got to tell you, this is a first class act here. This uh, this is unreal. <laughs> I mean, not only is the hotel spectacular, but everything that I have seen and, and been a part of here for the last couple of days is just top-notch. I, I don't know who all is responsible for this, but the committee members have just done an amazing job. <clears throat> that dinner that we had tonight out on the beach as the sun was going down was a, a first-of-a-kind experience for me, and it was incredible. And the mariachi band, mariachi band was the best I have ever heard, and I've heard a few of them. So this is just class. This is a class act from top to bottom, and it's not what I would expect from a bunch of drunks. But, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but this this really is something. You know, I think the speakers, we're, we're the lightweights. Uh, you know, we get on an airplane and come here and, and talk, but uh, uh, it's the committee members who spend a whole year prepping for this thing that really do the heavy lifting. Also, um want to acknowledge the two ladies down here who are doing the American Sign Language, Cindy and Rooney. And um, they are the two hardest working ladies in this room tonight. And uh, you'll notice that I'll glance down periodically because if they start to get ahead of me, I'll try to catch up. And, <laughs> well, you know, it could happen. Um, I also appreciate that nice basket that was in the in the room. I, I was, um, you know, one of the things that I love uh, about AA is some of our humor and the things that happen. Nobody's laughing when they first come in here. I certainly wasn't. I had nothing. I couldn't even muster a smile. There was nothing going on in my life that was I could even come up with a smile on. And I'm sitting here this morning at this table here. James was sitting to my left and. We're doing this um, kind of a panel thing, and and it turns out to be a two-hour deal, and and I've got to really go to the bathroom really bad. But I'm going to try to gut it out until we can get through this whole thing, and it becomes real apparent to me that I'm not going to make it, and it's going to get real embarrassing. So I think, God, I'm sitting up here in front. I hate to have to get up and go to the bathroom, but I got to. And so I slipped out the door and I said, where are the restrooms? They said, around to the left. And I'm, I'm hustling to get around to the restroom. And, and there's a person in front of me uh, about uh, oh, seven, ten seconds ahead of me. I think it was a guy. They're going for the bathroom and they make a left turn. And then I swing in there. And the first thing I notice is no urinals. <laughs> <laughs> but it's too late to turn around. And... So I slip into one of the stalls, and uh, and I, I'm going, well, they got all the plumbing here. This will work for sure. And um, and then I hear three ladies come in behind me. And I'm looking through the little slats, and I can see, and I can hear, see them and hear them. And uh, part of me, of course, by the time they come out of the slats, everything's done. They're washing their hands, and I want to pop out and go, hi, how you doing? <coughs> And I'm thinking, I'm going to be up at the podium tonight, and they're going to say, oh, my God, there's that guy that hangs out in the ladies' room. So I waited until they left. Unfortunately, nobody came in behind them, and I got out. But So I'd appreciate it if you just keep that story yourself. I'm not very proud. <laughs> so. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I, we come in here, and we do this laughing thing. And, and um, what a golden, precious, absolute gift that is that we get to the part and the point in our sobriety where we can laugh. I, uh, that's a precious, precious gift. And I'm so grateful because it was a long time before I could do that. A long time. 
My sobriety date is um, <clears throat> March the 7th of 1990. Um, my home group is Stockbridge Group in Stockbridge, Georgia. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to talk about what we were like, what happened, and what we're like. Now, I, knew, I used to say what it was like, and I didn't think it was a big deal. Still don't really, but some people do. And I got a real cryptic email from a guy in southwest Georgia. He said, I'm listening to one of your CDs, and i got newcomers here, and you're misquoting the big book. And I thought, what's he talking about? I don't quote the big book. I know some speakers do. I don't have that gift. Oh, well, you know, after I've seen or heard a couple of them do that, I'll just for the heck of it, I'll tell them. You know, if you go look at page 132, the second paragraph, and I have no idea what's there. I just know you'll go look. <laughs> but he said, you're saying what it was like, and it's what we're like. And I thought, oh, really? Come on. But I put my A face on. I said, well, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'll try to do better. And um, apparently it didn't have that ring of sincerity he was looking for. And I get a second email. He says, well, it's really important. You know, if well, some of us old-timers are sitting in the front row and you started off that way, we might just get up and walk out thinking, if you're going to start with misquoting the big book, the rest of the message can't be that worthwhile. And uh, so uh, about that time, my A face came off and my competitive spirit came up. I said, well... You know, if that happened, I don't think I'd burst into tears at the podium and I probably wouldn't rush out to get a drink afterwards. And I said, you know, I think I should point out to you that when we read how it works, it doesn't say rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly memorized the book. And that stopped the emails. But AA has its own way of working. And about three years later, I'm speaking down at the Flint River Roundup and he's my host. <laughs> At any rate, I'm going to start really with what happened because that was the part that really was the, the big attention getter. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. My last drinks were on March the 7th of 1990 in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. On March the 8th, an event took place that had never occurred before, and that was that an airline crew was arrested when they landed at Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport for having flown under the influence of alcohol and I was a captain of that flight crew. It's amazing because um, I watch that now. That's happened many times since my incident in 1990. But it's an, it's an old story. It's old news. You may see the pilot's name in the paper or on TV and on day two it's gone. That story is gone. I can assure you that was not the case when I had my incident since I was the very first pilot ever that this had happened to. And this thing was a national media blitzkrieg sensational story. It stayed on the news for weeks into months. And I thought it would never go away. It was the lead story locally, nationally, everywhere. Canada, it got to Asia and Europe. And I didn't think it would ever end. We were arrested that day early in the morning on March the 8th. The other thing I want to throw in here is the, is the idea that most of the time speakers come to the podium and they talk and they give this story of recovery and they leave and we don't know what they did for a living. It's not necessary. It's not really relevant to the story of recovery. It's not important. So when I talk about being an airline pilot, I'm talking about it only in terms of the story and the fact that that was what drove the story. That was what drove the media. That was also what set me up for a federal felony prison conviction and sentence. If I'd been a doctor, an attorney, plumber, electrician, construction worker, office worker, if I'd been anything other than what I was, none of those things would have occurred. So it's only in the context of the story that I talk about being an airline pilot. I'm one of these guys that believes that we don't have any status in this fellowship. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you make. I don't care how many tapes you've got out here on the table. I don't care how long you've been sober. Well, I care about it. I appreciate and respect the time. I don't think we have any A celebrities, although I've met a few that think they are. But the <clears throat> my feeling, my personal feeling is that the highest level of prestige and status that we will ever rise to and achieve in this fellowship is the thing that we all come here for and is called sobriety. And... An And until I get an email saying that we just broke ground on the AA Hall of Fame, I will continue to think that's the way it's supposed to work. I was detained for 12 hours that day, and I can tell you that 
from the moment I walked off the airplane and I saw two airport policemen, I saw FAA officials, and I saw Northwest Airlines management people, I knew what the outcome of this story was going to be. Northwest Airlines at that time was the only major carrier that did not have a program for alcoholic pilots. Those programs had come into place in the mid-70s, and they were highly, highly successful, ranging 88 to 92 percent success rate. Pretty phenomenal. Not because of airline pilots, but because of the way they're structured. The heavy-duty, long-term monitoring, reporting, responsibility, testing, all of these things resulted in a, in a very high success rate. But Northwest had refused to go along with that, with the industry standard. And so every few years when I saw a pilot get in trouble, if his drinking or the party time came to the attention of the company, the outcome was always the same. It was swift, it was irreversible, it was fatal. And that pilot was terminated, never came back. In the meantime, those stories swept through the airline like wildfire. Among the pilots and flight attendants, we heard those stories, and they raged through the airline. And so I had a list on my mental hall of shame involving those names and those locales and the details as best I knew them. And over the millions of thoughts that I had that day, the 12 hours that I was detained, one of them was, that's my legacy. That's how I leave this airline. That's where my name goes. That wasn't supposed to happen to me. I have not been a person who lived my life in shame and disgrace. I have never been a falling down, stumble bum drunk. I'm going to talk about two parents who were alcoholics and died from this disease. But I never go to the podium without thanking my, my parents for the good things they gave my sister and me, two years younger than I am, before they died. I acknowledge those things. I owe a debt. And I tried to espouse and live up to those standards until my alcoholism took them away and, and disabled me, and I couldn't no longer do that. The shame was overwhelming, and the disgrace and the dishonor was absolutely overwhelming. Later in treatment, I wondered about that, and I looked at it, and I thought, most of that came from the fact that I had raised three kids who were grown and gone, and I had been the guy in the family, the flag bearer, the standard bearer, for things like duty, honor, country, character, honesty, integrity, do the right thing. And the personal example that I had just set, which was going to catapult me to the front of the aviation world as the biggest pariah in all of American commercial aviation it was more than I could handle. It nullified and rendered void all of those things that I had tried to teach my children, and I had a difficult time with that. I had a really hard time with it. Later, as things progress, and I'll get to that, I picked up a meditation book, and at the top of it, it said, my father didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch him do it. And that helped, because I thought, you know, I didn't plan it this way. But maybe what my kids had to watch and how this, this story goes, that was had more value and more meaning, more meaning than anything that I had tried to tell them. We went to two facilities and gave blood, and it was at the second facility that a reporter saw three uniformed pilots and two uniformed police officers and thought there might be a story there, and that's how it broke to the public. At that moment in time, I had no idea that was going to occur. The mere fact that that was going to sweep through Northwest Airlines was enough to absolutely destroy me. And then it ends up on the late night comics routine. Everybody's laughing and having a good time. The tabloids. I've got, I've still got several of those. People Magazine published an article written by some idiot that um, thought he knew what was in my mind and it completely distorted the story. But all of those things were out in the public realm and I knew the public was reading them and seeing them, believing them and laughing at them and having a good time with them. I wasn't able to get home that evening and I called and left a very whispered and defeated message on the phone machine to Barbara. She was supposed to pick me up at the airport. She waited for four hours that night, and I didn't show up. And uh, 
I left a message and I said, there's been a disaster. I think I've lost my job. And I'll be in the first flight in the morning. Don't know why she didn't call me back after I haven't gotten that message, but that was a gift that I didn't see until later. I got home the next morning on the first flight. Knew I'd never wear that uniform again, not ever. Made it out of the airport as quickly as I could because I knew a lot of people there. I knew all the baggage handlers and mechanics and groomers and agents and used to laugh and joke and have a good time. I didn't want any of them to see me, speak to me, or stop me, and so I exited very quickly. I've never told a story. With what I haven't said, I got to the airport and Barbara was parked off to the right. And I felt like I had to climb over the curb to get in the car with her. The shame was that great. She and I had been married a long time. I couldn't even look at her. She pulled away from the curb, and all I could say is, Honey, I'm so sorry. She said to me, very softly, Who better than I might understand how you feel right now? And that's all she said, and we drove home in silence. Again, another gift that I didn't see for a while. Because later I thought, What wife, having learned that her husband had just trashed a 22-year golden career as an airline captain, would not have said, You've seen this before. You knew the Northwest policy. Why did you stay and drink? Why didn't you go back to your hotel room? All those questions she had a right to ask, and I didn't have an answer for any of them. But she said nothing, and we drove home. She went to work. I went in the house. I couldn't stay still. I did not want to be in my own skin. And there was only one phone number that I knew that I could call, and he was a family therapist. And he gets involved in the story here in a little bit. I didn't know anybody to call, and I called his office, and I said, there's been a disaster. I need to declare an emergency. I need to see you right away. He said, come straight in, and uh, he cleared his calendar, and I went in. Then it was like it happened five minutes ago because I can see you, but up here I can also see that office and that layout and the color of the walls and where he was. The good thing about what had happened was I was done. I was through. I was beaten. I quit. So I told him straight out what had happened. I didn't try to soften the story. I just told him straight out what had happened. And he pulled back in some shock and stunned surprise. And he said, God, Lyle, he said, this is uh, this horrible. He said, this is absolutely horrible. He started around his desk, and he stopped, and he turned to his left, and he looked at me. This is now Friday, March the 9th. And I was going to hear two statements that day that I could not even begin to mentally process. And I heard the first one. Because he looked at me and said, but maybe this is what had to happen. And I thought, why would he say that to me? Where did that come from? And what? why would he even say that to me? But I couldn't respond. And he came back a, a few minutes later and he said, okay, I want you to go see a doctor tonight. And he said, I was on staff with him. He wants to see you at 6 o'clock tonight at his office. It's across Atlanta. He's a recovering alcoholic and cocaine addict. He's also a very prominent psychiatrist, and he's certified in addiction medicine. I had never heard of addiction medicine. I had no idea such a thing existed. I did pick up on the 6 o'clock appointment time. Even in the shredded condition that I was in, that registered. Conveyed a certain sense of urgency. Later, that doctor told me, he said, based on your appearance, he said, I was afraid you were a suicide. And he said, it was important that you get to see this doctor right away. I thought, I don't know what he saw, and I don't know what he heard, but I'm starting to have some, starting to have some dark thoughts already. They're creeping. They're, they're small, but I'm starting to have them. Barbara and I drove over there. I have absolutely no, no memory of that meeting, just like a blackout, except I hadn't had anything to eat or drink for two days. I don't know how long I was in there. I know that every time he asked me a question, I gave him an answer that was as straight and honest as I possibly had the capacity for at that moment. At some point in that interview, he looked at me, he took my history, and he looked at me, he said, Lyle, he said, you're an alcoholic, and you need to get into treatment tonight. One of the things that I recall is that I had no reaction to that. And that's important because I've hated alcoholics. All my life, I have hated alcoholics. I saw my parents, I saw what happened to the family I grew up in. I grew up in a native community. I saw what happened there. I flew around this country, and I saw drunks in the alleyways and the doorways, sprawled on the grass, passed out. Those were drunks. Those were alcoholics. I had no, no identification with any of that. But in the 24 hours since the arrest, in a way that I will never understand, way down deep, I knew those dots got connected. 
I knew that I'd become that one thing I swore I would never be. I knew. So when he told me, I looked at him and I said, I thought you would tell me that, and I'm okay with it. And I said, I just got home tonight. I said, please, please let me go home. And I said, I'd like for Barbara to just hang on to me. I said, let my mind uncoil. Let me just absorb what's happened to me, and I'll go into treatment. He said, you need to go into treatment tonight. And I paused and took a breath. I said, okay. So we drove back across Atlanta. We made the final turn. This treatment center was two and a half miles from the Atlanta International Airport. I had no idea it was there. I had no reason to know anything about it. We made the final turn, and as I did so, the, sign, the headlights swept a sign that's no longer there, but it was at the time. It said, Anchor Hospital, a hospital for alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. And I hit the brakes. The sign's in front of me, and the lights are on the sign, and the reality is there. And I thought, my God, what happened? My life ends tonight in a treatment center for alcoholics. What happened? It's not supposed to be this way. And I had a little brief mini flashback over the years of my life and the really high points, the, the, the miracles, the accomplishments, the achievements that I was so proud of that it had given me some kind of definition and reputation that I was... And, and for a moment I thought, I, I don't even know if those exist. It was like somebody with an eraser took them off the board and I'm going, I don't... I, and I sat there completely devoid of any sense of self-esteem or value as a human being. I just it was a zero. Some years later, I read a par uh, summarizing paragraph that one of the doctors had written at the end of a lengthy report on me, and he said, given the history and background of this man, it was unlikely to believe he would ever be a productive member of society. I kind of flinched at that. I thought, oh, man, that is really dismal. And then I thought, well, I'm the one that gave him all the information. <laughs> so we started down the hill into the treatment center. For the first time that day, I thought, this is March the 9th. This is my 27th wedding anniversary. And I said to Barbara, Hell of a way to spend an anniversary, huh? I then heard the second statement that I could not respond to and could not process. And very softly she said, might be the best one we ever had. I thought, who could say that? Who could think that? I've seen this before. The other incidents at Northwest hadn't been 10% as bad as mine was and was going to be. And there is no coming back from this. I've seen this before. My life is over. There is no question about it. It's over and it's gone. How could she possibly have a thought like that at a moment like this? And I didn't say anything. We headed on down the hill into the treatment center. Now, I like to kind of mix this up a little bit and tell you that about, um, I think it was nine years ago now that one of the it was 9 o'clock in the morning, one of, it was our March the 9th, and one of my sponsees pulled up very unexpectedly. Beautiful, gorgeous Georgia morning at 9. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, it's, I've heard the story. I know it's your anniversary. I thought I'd just surprise you, stop by, and, and uh, wish you both a happy anniversary. We went inside, and Barbara had coffee going. The conversation was light and lively. And, and um, he says, well, uh, what's the secret to having stayed married so long? And before I had it chance to respond, Barbara said, well, mostly due to the fact that I could never stand to admit I made a mistake. So, <clears throat> so I, I always tell people, you know, one of the big mistakes I made was telling her this was an ego-deflating program, and that's her job. It was a couple of years ago, I was speaking at a women's prison. I've been there before, and I'm slated to go back again, and, um, you know, women's prison is not like you know, what we normally, uh, they don't look like you ladies look tonight. They don't. And there's about 25 or 30 of them in there. And they're pretty rough. And they're in these oversized khaki scrubs and no hair makeup and no nothing. And they're a pretty hard looking bunch. And, and um, all tattoos, body piercings, and a good bunch of ladies, but not what I'm used to. And 
So I'm telling this story. I'm starting to get into it, and one of them yells out from the audience, You're hot. <laughs> I've never had that happen before, and that um, it kind of stopped me for a moment, and I'm trying to regroup, and about that time, two or three more yell out, Yeah, you're hot. Anyway, I recover, I get through the story, and by the time I get home, it's midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, and Barbara's in bed and sleep, so the next morning we're having coffee. And I thought, well, she probably needs to know this. And <laughs> So we're having coffee, and I tell her about it. And she takes a sip of her coffee and looks at me, and she says, they must have been locked up a really long time. <laughs> So I want to introduce you to my favorite fan supporter. Barbara, would you stand up a minute, please? You see me keep glancing down here. I've got a timer. And um, so I've got about another two hours and 20 minutes to go. So. <laughs> yeah. At any rate, let me, uh, let me tell you that um, I, was, uh, I was born in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, September 29th, 1938, so that, means, that makes me 78. I go ahead and get it out of the way because I, I know that uh, I'm not the only person that sits out there and tries to guess the age of the speakers. And and, um, and usually I can do that, except for the fact that the lady speakers are always the worst. They never give you much to work with. And they'll, uh, you know, somebody will give a date or two, and uh, like uh, last night, I quickly figured out how old Linda was because she told us how old she was when she got sober, and then she told us how, how long she'd been sober. I can do the math on that. <laughs> Stacy, I had no clue about. She didn't give us anything. But usually what they'll do is they'll say, um, I graduated from college. And I'm going, well, that was 21 or 22. Um, the same year Kennedy was assassinated. And I'm going, well, what is that, 63, 64? And I'm adding, subtracting, debiting, crediting. And, or I, had, uh, I was 24 and I had my first child. It was the same year that uh, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And I, so I'm trying to think, was that 68 or 69? Add, subtract. And by the time she leaves, I'm going to, I have no idea. She's either 43 or 68. And um, <laughs> so I just, I just go ahead and get it out of the way. Um, I grew up in a World War II housing project on the southeast edge of Wichita called Plainview. It was supposed to be a very temporary project. That place is still there. It was built during World War II. And, um, it was economically disadvantaged. The, the folks with money didn't live out there. And uh, I can tell you, though, that those were the happiest days of my life. It was literally happy days in the 50s. Um, and uh, there were, uh, it was a very uh, diverse community, blacks and whites, Hispanics, a small Native American segment. I was part of the Native American segment. I'm a mixture of about four different things, but the two that always show up at the bar with me are the Irish and Comanche parts. <laughs> So, but you know, it was a good place to grow up. We were, none of us had anything. No, we were always behind. My parents were always struggling. We never had anything that was nice or good. Everything was patched or broken. But yeah, my memories of that were really happy until the alcohol finally destroyed the family. As a matter of fact, I just went back there uh, last October, Barbara and I did, for my 60th high school reunion uh, with some, a lot of those friends of mine that are still there. Not in that community. The, that place has fallen down around itself, but it still exists. We didn't have any drive-by shootings, no gangs, no drugs. Um, I've never done any drugs. I didn't even smoke cigarettes. Um, most of the everybody smoked in the 50s. They're smoking in the movies. They're doing all this stuff. And uh, I just didn't smoke for some reason. Really, I'm maybe not good at multitasking. I'd rather, instead of have a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other hand, I'd rather have a drink in both hands and then I'm ready to go. <clears throat> I, um, when I was 14, uh, the alcohol had completely destroyed the family. The family was completely imploded, and a lot of bad things happened. And my parents got a divorce, and that was uh, pretty traumatic for me, as it was for my sister. And within the next three years, each parent had been married and divorced two more times. And I didn't get along in blended families. I didn't get along with step-parents or step-siblings, and there'd be clashes and fights, and I'd be asked to go to the other family, and I would do that, and then something would occur over there, and then I'd switch back and forth, and by that time, faces would change, names would change. And I don't remember any of those people. I had the ability to be a good student when I applied myself, but I was all alone. Nobody was watching. And I took advantage of that. And I squandered a lot of academic opportunity I could have had during my high school years. I graduated from high school when I was 17. 
and I was an athlete in high school. I thought I was a pretty good ball player, but I was probably average. But um, I had decided most of the people from my area didn't go to college. They married their little high school sweethearts. They went to work in one of the aircraft factories that uh, that Wichita is known for. It's called the air capital of the world, Boeing Beach Cessna, and there was a couple of others there at the time. I wasn't interested in that. I was going to join the service. And about that time, one of my buddies came back from the Marine Corps right out of boot camp, and I was impressed. I was really impressed. And he and I sat in a bar for about three or four hours one afternoon as he regaled me with these uh, stories of what Marine drill instructors do to their recruits in boot camp. And these were brutal, cruel, sadistic stories. And I had just turned 18, and I suppose it was probably an early indication of my thinking not being real good because I'm, I'm hanging on these stories, and I'm thinking, man, I just can't wait to go do that. And within a couple of days, I had signed on the line, and off I went into Marine Corps boot camp. I mean this with no offense and no disparagement, but Marine Corps boot camp is not like the other services. And I don't mean that as an insult to the other service. I mean that as a statement of fact. It's just simply not the same as other services. And I got into that. I hear a lot of people from the podium say, I never fit in. That's not my story. And uh, nor is it my story that the first drink I had worked its magic and I was going to change that, chase that for the rest of my life. It's true for the people to tell you, but that's not my story. And I got into Marine Corps boot camp, and once I got in there and got over the initial shock of it, I fit in. I found a place, and I excelled, and I loved it. It was extraordinarily difficult. It was extraordinarily intense. It was extraordinarily demanding. And the camaraderie was something I had never experienced before in my life. This sense of belonging, this brotherhood, this one for all, all for one, this inextricable bonding that the Marine Corps is known for, was something I had never experienced before, and I loved it. And I was going to stay and be a Marine. I was one of three out of 70 whose names were called at the end of the 13 weeks, the three top guys, and I got a PFC stripe, private first class. Now, you don't run the Marine Corps as a private first class, but I can tell you it was meaningful because 67 of my buddies were still slick sleeve privates, and I had that stripe. I couldn't take my eyes off it. I kept looking at that one stripe, private first class. We went to Camp Pendleton, immediately drew guard duty. It's raining, it's cold outside. My buddies are outside with rifles on their shoulder, walking post in the rain. Because I got that stripe, I'm acting corporal of the guard, and I'm in the Quonset hut, and nice and dry and warm. I look over in the corner, and I saw First Lieutenant's uniform hanging up over there. I saw the silver bar. And I slid my chair back, and I thought, by God, you know, at the rate I'm moving up, General's not that far away. (laughs) And I'm staying. I stayed and I excelled. Now, I'm not going to do a drunk log tonight. I'm, I, I could do one. I could spend the entire hour up here doing a drunk log, giving you all this record of my drinking episodes and the things that happened and the events. But I'm going to summarize it and tell you that my drinking was like every alcoholics I've ever heard with some varying degrees. I also think that these conferences are fertile ground for newcomers to come here and decide they don't belong because our stories are all over the place. Our stories are very diverse. Drinking patterns change. Drinking procedures change. I can say 26 and a half years sober. I was in a meeting the other night. I, we're doing a first step meeting for a newcomer. I thought, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't drink that way. But I drank my way. And my way was alcoholically. I got in fights. I lost cars. I woke up in places I didn't know where I was or how I got there. All of these things happened to me. A lot of blackouts. I had two DWIs up in Minnesota about five years apart. Both of them just bad luck coincidence. Could happen to anybody. That was my that was my mantra. That could happen to anybody. And then I get into treatment and I do a first step look back and I go, God, there's two pages of things. These could not all happen to just one person. But I've got a good ending buddy. He talks about his sixth DWI. He was in court for his sixth DWI before he ever learned that that did not stand for drinking with Indians. <clears throat> my drinking was hard and heavy from the get go, but I was always in a hard drinking environment. So it was difficult to separate me from a normal drinker because the people I was with are hard drinkers. I was a young Marine. I was supposed to be tough. I was supposed to be able to drink hard. Later, I was a fighter pilot. I'm supposed to be able to fly hard, play hard, drink hard. Later, I'm an airline pilot. Same thing there. For four and a half years, I stayed in the Marine Corps, and I excelled. I I got meritorious promotion to Lance Corporal. I always was doing well. I'm accustomed to doing well. Four and a half years into the Marine Corps, they came to me and they said, there's a brand new program out called Marine Aviation Cadet. 
and you're the only guy in this entire unit who has entry scores high enough to qualify you to test for that program. I had always wanted to fly, but that was nowhere close on my lifetime reality radar scope. Pilots I knew had to have college educations, and I didn't have that. And they came from good families in different parts of Wichita. And I didn't have that either. They didn't come out of Plainview, a World War II housing project. They didn't come out of a Native American community, and they didn't come out of an alcoholic home. But he is offering me an opportunity to go test, and I tested and passed. It was an all-day thing. He said, there's some things you need to know. He said, you're testing out because you're one of the very few enlisted Marines coming in the back door. 98, 99% of the people coming into this program come in from the civilian side, and they must have two years college minimum to even come in here and apply. And many of them will have more than that, and that will be your comp competition. And so I knew that I had a good chance of not making it because I was starting way off with a huge educational deficit. But I wanted to try, and I said, I want to try. And I went home to Wichita. They were having a powwow. I'd grown up in my culture. I was a dancer. I knew the songs and the traditions. And I went out. They called for an honoring dance because I was going to Pensacola the next day. And I led the dance around the arena, and I was really impacted as people that I had grown up with came out and joined behind me, and we went around the arena. And on the way to Pensacola the next day, I'm thinking, I, there's no way I can come back to this community early and tell them I'm out because I flunked out, I washed out, I couldn't handle it. I cannot come back here and face this community. And nobody but me has this opportunity. And I was haunted with that thought and driven with that for 18 months. There were four phases to flight training at that point in time. And through every one of those phases, I was the number two guy in my ranking class. I never got cocky. I never got confident. I never thought I've got it made. I never believed I was doing as well as my grades indicated. And I'm watching my friends wash out, weekly, sometimes daily. And they were heartbroken. And they would come say goodbye to me with a sea bag over their shoulder. And I don't remember any of them ever meeting my eyes. Their eyes were averted. Their hearts were broken. Their dreams were shattered. They wanted to fly as much as I did. And for whatever reason, they weren't going to. And every time one of them walked away, I thought, at some point before this is over, that will be me. But I continued to push ahead and push hard. And one of the things I owe my parents is a hell of a hard work ethic. I will work. I will get dirty. I will sweat. I will do anything I need to do to get the job done. And that's a gift from my parents. The last six months, I left the Florida area, and I went to Texas for advanced jet flight training. The first night into town, I hooked up with a bunch of my friends that we'd gotten split up and separated from, and we went to the officer's club and got drunk. They wanted to go into town to this little drive-in called Canes, and they said that's where the good-looking South Texas girls are, and we've got an inside track because we're going to be young hotshot fighter pilots, commissioned Marine Corps officers. And they like us. So I said, okay, I'll go. And um, I was never very gutsy with the gals, but I went with them there. And um, they immediately went after this carload of girls, and I hung back a little bit, drinking some more. I could see the driver, but not very well. She was at an angle. And I drank, and I thought, okay, I'll rehearse a bunch of this stuff And um, before I make my approach. And I came up with some stuff that was even deadlier than normal. And um, I thought, okay, I'm ready. So I walked up to the car, and I thought, Jesus, on the way up there, I thought she might just take her clothes off sitting there because this is good stuff. And uh, I went, I walked up there, and she turned and looked at me, and everything vacated. I don't know where it went, but I was empty, and she's looking at me, and the only thing I saw were those brown eyes. And I said, you have the prettiest brown eyes. But it didn't come out right. And it came out, I just got these brown eyes. <laughs> and she kind of pulled back and looked at me. I mean, I could like I just stood there and peed on the side of her car and she and I see the expression and I know I've screwed up and I know I can't talk and I'm embarrassed and I walk back and I leave and I'm back there drinking I'm not going back again and a little while later she got out to go to the ladies room and I got a good look just like I was standing right here and I see her go down the aisle there I can wise watch and she had turquoise shorts on I go god she's got a cute butt pretty legs those brown eyes a lot more than I had on my list and um I, you know, and I tell people, I said, I, li I literally had an AA thought at that time. I didn't know it was an AA thought. And I didn't recognize it for about 29 more years. But I was watching her walk in, and I thought, man, I want what she has, and I'm willing to go to any length to get it. <laughs> That's her favorite part of the story. She's <laughs> and I did. The, um, 
had a chance encounter with her the next day. She had a girlfriend with her. I had a buddy with me. And I walked. I saw her going to this place. And we went in there, and I was nervous, but I was sober. She let me buy her a cup of coffee. Told me her name was Barbara, and eventually, reluctantly, said I could call her. So I did. And on February the 25th, 1963, her X number of birthday, if she wasn't here, I'd tell you which one it was. But she, um, it was her birthday, and she pinned a set of gold wings right here over my heart. She pinned two gold bars on my shoulders. And it was a day beyond anything that Hollywood could have scripted. It was perfect. I had now made it. I could go home. And I had done well the entire way through. And I had this girl who thought I was okay. So we go back to Wichita, and we're there for three weeks, and she's staying with my sister, and the leave's coming to an end. And I called her. I said, you're going to Texas. I've got orders to California. Let's go to Oklahoma and get married. So we ran down there on March the 9th, 1963, and got married. And March coming up will be number 54 for us. <laughs> I had a tremendous Marine Corps career. We were one of the first jet squadrons into Vietnam. And um, we were flying out of a little primitive airstrip 50 miles south of Chulai. Typical Marine Corps operation. No creature comforts of any sort. We lived in the sand and sea ra ate sea rations out of cans and tents. We had no air conditioning, nothing. No cold water. Ice cubes, when we got them, our cold water was a luxury. Just reveled in a drink of cold water when we could get it. I put in for a regular commission. That was very competitive and very selective at that time. I knew full well I wouldn't get one because they don't give regular commissions to officers with no college. And I got a regular commission. So that's what I'm accustomed to doing. I'm accustomed to going the extra mile, to accomplishing and achieving. I'm not accustomed to becoming the biggest pariah in all of American commercial aviation, to being on the late night talk shows, to being made fun of, to disgrace everything that I held dear and, and had any value to me, my family, the Marine Corps, my airline, my profession, my heritage, because that's what alcohol, alcohol, alcoholism does to an alcoholic like me because pretty soon I don't call the shots anymore. And it happened so slowly for me that I didn't see it. I could not see it until this event happened, and then I saw it. And all the wheels came off at one time. And thank God they did before I killed somebody, or I got killed, or I died like my parents did. If I got nothing more out of this friend, out of this fellowship than the fact that my children will not have to watch and experience what I got, had to watch and experience, if I got nothing more than that, I've been overpaid. I've been overpaid. I went through treatment. I didn't want anybody to know who I was or what I was. So ashamed. I couldn't, it was a week before anybody knew the color of my eyes. I could not look up. I couldn't talk to anybody. About day two or day three, the media has it. Now everybody in there knows who I am. I had amazing experiences in there. I had kind of passed over a thing that said that when we went to the, I got out of the Marine Corps after 11 and a half years and went to work for Northwest Airlines three weeks after I got out. Had a great Marine Corps career. And for nearly 22 years at Northwest, I had the same thing. But Barbara and I talked about adopting a little girl or a child even before we got married. And because we had two little boys already, she wanted a daughter. So we put in for an adoption, and it was very difficult because we had two biological kids, and we fought a hard fight. And 14 months later, we bring this little Indian girl home to our house, a little Chippewa girl. She was 17 days old when we got her. Most beautiful little girl I have ever seen in my life. And Barbara now had her daughter. Adoption's only a word. She couldn't walk past me without me picking her up and looking at that beautiful little face and saying, thanks for being my girl. She'd say, thanks for being my dad. I thought we had the perfect everything, perfect career, perfect family, perfect home finally after 13 years in the airlines. And when she was coming up on her seven, she was 17 and coming up on high school graduation, she ran away. I don't know what prompted that. Still don't today because she won't talk about it. She talks around things. She, don't talk, she doesn't talk about things. I was in Chicago taking a test. I passed up being a captain for two years. So I'm taking a test. I wanted to be home with my daughter until she graduated and went to college, I thought. And she picked that afternoon to run away, get her stuff, and leave a note for Barbara, which Barbara didn't see until late that night. I called home the next day ready to come home, and Barbara said that Dawn was gone. I panicked. I blurted out instructions on where to go and who to call and where to look. I got on the airplane scared to death. My little girl's gone, and I don't know what's happening to her. 
Something happened to me on that two-hour flight home, and I'm not aware of it. I was not aware of any kind of a conscious change coming over me. But when I got off the airplane, I hated her. I hated her worse than I thought I had the capacity to hate anyone or anything. And I told Barbara, I said, I don't care where she, I don't care if she dies in the streets. She will never come back to my home. And I told the family and friends, never mention her name in my presence as long as I'm alive. And I was this raging white hot cauldron of boiling hatred about the one, about the little girl that I had once given my entire heart to. She was the center of my universe and I hated her. The alcohol quit working for me. I'm not an alcoholic because Don ran away, but it accelerated the process because now when I went on layovers, I didn't want to go out with the crew. I didn't want to do anything. I knew wherever liquor store was and every town we ever laid over in. I knew how long it took me to change clothes and get up there and get back to my hotel. And I would do that. And I'd go up and buy a quart of booze. I'd go back to my room. I'd lock the door, turn the TV set on. I wouldn't go to the door if a crew member knocked. I wouldn't answer the phone if they called. All I want to do is drink. And I mix drinks strong. I don't like it straight, but I mix them strong. And I usually sometimes have to choke the first drink down. I don't know if any of you do that, but I have to choke. The first. I struggle to get the first one down. After that, everything is smooth and fast. And I never got the relief that alcohol had always given me before. That warm glow feeling, that lessening of tension, that I don't care what's wrong with the world, everything's okay now. I don't care. This is okay. That soothing, floating away, relaxing feeling that I can even feel right now. I never got that again. I could never recapture that. Because from that moment on, every time I took a drink, it was like I had a burner, a furnace going in my gut down here. And that, that alcohol hit it and was like it was gasoline. And up flashed the hatred and the bitterness and the self-pity and the martyrdom. And this list of all these things that I had done for this little girl over all these years that she would never have been able to enjoy in her family, big things that we had done. And look how she repaid me. And at the end of the bottle, by the time it was done, I was emotionally exhausted. But the very next night in a different town, I would do it all over again. And again, and again, and again. And that's where we were when this arrest took place. I had amazing experiences in treatment because I bought into it. I had no more answers that were good for me, and so I listened. I wasn't one of the crowd that wanted to debate, analyze, argue, try to figure this out. I listened, and I saw the eyes of my counselors and the doctors, all of whom were in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I knew they were telling me the truth. Frankly, I began to think that I would get sober, but I would never have a life again. I would never have a life again, but maybe I could stay sober. And I wondered, does this really work, this 12-step stuff, this big book stuff, this 12 and 12? Does it work out here on the streets and sidewalks once I leave treatment? Or I walk out of an AA meeting. For the newcomers here, let me tell you, it does. It really does. But I have to do my part in it. The first week of treatment, I walked into a room not intending to talk, a group room with about eight or ten of us that closed the door. Talking was counterintuitive to me. But for some reason that day I began to talk, and I talked about my daughter. The one thing that I had always had as a coping mechanism was anger. One time when we were in a family therapist session, he said something to me about my daughter, and I looked at him, and I said, I'm going to tell you something, doctor. I would rather hate than hurt. That was a one sentence capsulization of who I was and what I did and how I did it. He said, you survived a childhood doing that, and if you continue, it will destroy you. And he was oh so right. I walked into the room that afternoon, a group room, and I didn't have that anger anymore. I didn't have that thing to block the pain. And I started to talk about my daughter, and I broke down and cried. And I don't cry. I didn't cry at my parents' funerals. I cried that day because it hit me right in the heart and it broke and I sobbed and I was embarrassed. It was one of the greatest breakthroughs I ever had in treatment because now I could feel again. And I was ashamed. I felt like I was sitting there with no clothes on, but they, they got around me and they hugged me and, and things. But it was, and I wrote to Barbara after that. I said, get a hold of Don. 
has put the family back together again. The treatment center had no visitors, no phone calls. And they heard about this, and they said, we'll give you a day room and make an exception if you can get her up here. Barbara knew where she was. And some days later, Don showed, and the two doctors, the family therapist and the doctor who diagnosed me, heard about it and said, could we come watch? And so I walked into a day room, and there was my little girl. And I looked at her, and I thought, God, she's smaller than I remember. I hadn't seen her for two years. And my two sons were there. Barbara was there. The two doctors were there. And I walked across the room. I wish I had words to tell you what it felt like for the first time in two years to put my arms around my little girl and say, I love you, instead of talking about how much I hate you. And she, was, she had been aware of my feelings. And in her arms was a five-month-old granddaughter that I didn't know anything about. Donna got married. I didn't even know her last name. I began to heal that day, and I wish I could tell you that that was the beginning of a long, wonderful journey between me and my daughter, but my daughter's life hasn't gone well, not because of alcoholic drugs that I'm aware of, but her life is kind of a train wreck. But I have a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a thing called a serenity prayer. I can't change that. It's her journey. It's her journey, just as mine is mine. And so I learned this thing called acceptance. I accept that. I will always be sad, brokenhearted, and disappointed at the way things turned out. But I don't drink over it. I accept it. It is what it is, and I allow it to be that. Suddenly, in the treatment center, I began to get word of legal consequences. Nothing, none of the attorneys on the day of the arrest knew anything about legal consequences. And now they begin to come down, and they've got to come tell me. This isn't like their Barbara called and said our washing machine don't work. You know, she, they can't. She, they they want me folk, but they, this is big stuff that's starting to happen out there. And so I go through six of these legal crises every two to three days, and they're talking about going to jail. Minnesota filed charges. North Dakota filed charges. Minnesota doubled the charges. North Dakota doubled the charges. The federal marshals are coming down to take me out of treatment in handcuffs so I could be arraigned. And then the last time I stepped out, and every time they do this, it's like they suck the air out of the room and I can't breathe. I mean, it stops my heart. I've never been to jail. The only time I thought I would ever be locked up in a prison was in Vietnam if I was shot down. And now I'm looking at a jail time in an American jail or an American prison, and it stops my heart. The last time I stepped outside, there was a doctor. I thought, oh, my God, there's never been a doctor before. And they called me out of these groups. We go down to his office. He said, Lyle, I have to tell you, the federal grand jury has just indicted you. You're looking at 15 years in federal prison, a $250,000 fine, and an attorney's coming in Sunday and wants $50,000. We went broke in the first 30 days. I didn't have the money, and he said, I have to ask you if you're going to hurt yourself. I said, no. I walked back to my room, numb, just numb. I don't remember collapsing in my room, but I did. I remember the next thing I recall is I was crying. My head was on the carpet. I was crying for the second time in treatment. And I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I don't have anything left. I said, I can't even do it one more time, not even one more time. Please help me. I slept that night. I had a lot of life-changing experiences in treatment because I believed it. It was all AA, 12-step stuff. I got out of treatment. I was, I mean, I got out of treatment. I was immediately arraigned in a Minnesota in a three-week trial. I'm trying to cut this to keep some kind of semblance of uh, time consideration here. And I'm telling you right now, you'll hear about 30% of the entire story. There's just too much to it. I went up to Minnesota. I had an experience with an attorney that I'd love to share with you, and I can't in the interest of time. I had an amazing experience with this man. I wanted to plead guilty, and he talked me out of it because he said, the publicity doesn't serve you well, and you will not come out well if you go ahead and plead guilty to this. And I said, okay. Treatment, they said, you've got to learn to trust people and listen. And so I said, okay, I'll do what you think is best. We drew the toughest judge in the Minnesota Federal District which was consistent with my luck the entire way through. Any time there was the possibility, which was not often, but the possibility of something going one way or the other, it never, not once ever, went the way that I hoped it would go. 
Never. So I go through this trial, but I had an advantage over the other two guys because I'm an alcoholic, and I can go to an AA meeting at night. And we're sitting through a courtroom, and if you've never if you've never sat in a criminal trial, especially one that's highly publicized, it's indescribable. There are no words for that. And I'm sitting there listening to myself being portrayed as the most worthless piece of crap on the face of the planet. I have never had any value. I never will have any value. And I can't respond to it. And it's being picked up and publicized and people believe it. And once in a while I could look across the courtroom and I would see Barbara and she would look at me. And she would mouth the words, I love you. And I'd nod. I'd be okay. I go to the meetings at night when I could. <clears throat> I never shared. First it was scary because they recognized me. I'm all over TV. They recognized me. And I sat in the rooms, and I just listened to the others talk. And there's an energy in that room. Then I took it to the courtroom the next day, and I got through the next day. I told my attorney, I'll be found guilty. And when I am, it will be okay. I want you to know it will be okay. The jury goes out at the end of three weeks. The jury comes right back in. I know what that probably means. I'm the captain. Everything comes to me first. I stand up. Guilty. He's standing to my right. He flinches, and I reached over and patted him. I said, it's okay, Peter. It's all right. We come back a month later for the sentencing. Sentencing guidelines were in place 12 months to 18 months. I know I'm going to get 18 months because I'm the captain. Those guidelines have gone away now. But I know I'm going to get 18 months, and um, a day and a half before sentencing, my attorney calls me. He said, I've got some bad news. I thought, Jesus, you've always got bad news. He never ever called me and said, hey, Lyle, i got some good news. He said, the judge has just notified the media and the other two attorneys that he's going to depart upwards from the sentencing guidelines. He can now go all the way to 15 years. And this judge had strong feelings about this case, and I saw those feelings every day of the trial. And he was entitled to those feelings because what I had been involved in was a horrific betrayal of the public trust. I'm a hardcore believer in acceptance of personal responsibility. And when you do what you did, you get what you got. The pain of all of this and the tragedy of alcoholism is that Barbara didn't deserve it. And she got it as well as I did. So did my kids. That's the tragedy of this disease. Not what happens to me. It's what happens to everybody who cares anything about me. I'd been in treatment with a federal judge, and he told me about sentencing. He said, that's a charade. He said, that's just a charade. He said, when we come through the door, the sentence is set. He said, even though you're going to talk, your attorney will talk, maybe you'll have witnesses. He said, that's just a charade. He said, when we come through the door, the sentence is set, and we never change. I've had judges and attorneys from all over the United States in these talks tell me that's true. They corroborated that. So I knew that whatever was getting ready to happen was not subject to change. There was nothing I was going to say that was going to change what was about to happen. So on that morning of sentencing, I stood as the first person to speak, so scared I didn't know what I was going to say, even as I stood to speak. And I talked about being grateful to be sober. I was grateful for the things, the good things that had happened within the family, the healing that had taken place there. I accepted responsibility for this event from day one. I couldn't change anything then. I couldn't change anything now. I just simply accepted responsibility. I had given my personal effects to Barbara. I said, I don't think I'll come back. He'll have us led away for the cameras. The judge did several things that surprised everyone. As he came to my sentencing, he sentenced me to 16 months. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Two months less under the guidelines. Some years later, he told my attorney in chambers, he said, that morning of sentencing, he said, I changed from the bench. The one th I knew a miracle had happened. I didn't know what or how. And I never thought I would find out. He said, I was going to sentence Lyle to four years in prison. And he said, I looked at him. I thought about him as a human being. I thought about his service in Vietnam. And he said, I came down from the bench. The other two received 12-month sentences. I got 25% more than they did, justifiably so. Then he did something that nobody expected. And he said, this is a complex case. This is the first time this law has ever been charged, used, or tried in a courtroom. It was not designed for pilots. And he said, there'll be legal appeals. I'll let you three men remain free until your appeals are exhausted. The other two said they would. I said, no, I will not. I'll go to prison now. 
I've been convicted. I will go now. The judge told my attorney later, he said, I was lost for words. He said, I have never had a defendant before or since do that. I looked at my attorney. I said, you wasn't lost very long. So he sentenced me on, on December the 5th of 1990. 34 years to the day that I'd entered Marine Corps boot camp, I checked into the Atlanta Federal Prison as inmate 04478-041. I don't tell prison stories from the podium. They're entertaining, but they have nothing to do with my recovery. I'll tell you my recovery has everything to do with what I dealt, did in prison and how I dealt with the people, the places, the situations, and the experiences in there, and I had a few of them. This is a first-person story, so you hear I, me, I, me, I, me. This is not about I or me. This is about us, you, me, we. This is about the power of the 12-step program and process and how I invoke and use each of these 12 steps when they're required and needed at any point and place in time, and I know how to use them. And that's what this is about. It's not about me being a tough ex-Marine. This is about what I've learned in recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I took that to prison, and I used it there. I served 424 days. One day at a time, shorter when necessary. The judge had put sanctions on me on top of the, the a week to the day that I entered treatment. Northwest terminated me, as they should have. The FAA had issued an emergency revocation of all my flight certificates, and I lost my FAA medical certificate because of my diagnosis of alcoholism. So everything I had in terms of flying credentials was gone. I had no education to fall back on. Now, I will tell you, there were some drug smugglers in prison that had worked for the big-time cartels. So I got a few flying offers while I was in there. <laughs> it didn't require a license. But I'm all done. I'm not going to fly again, especially after the judge puts sanctions on me. That completely closed. That put a, con a layer of concrete right over the top of my grave site and coffin. He closed the door. A year after I got out of prison, and another story that I don't have time to go into, he lifted those sanctions, miraculously lifted those sanctions. Not one chance in 10,000 you do it, but he did it. The FAA said, if you want to fly again, you'll start all over again at the bottom with a private license, which I'd never had. I came out of the Marine Corps, was immediately given a, a commercial license with an instrument rating. I'd never flown these little Cessnas and Pipers around, and I didn't think it was possible. And then I told Barbara, I said, I stay sober one day at a time. I will go after these licenses one license at a time. Ten and a half months later, I'd pass the writtens on all four licenses, and that was a mountain of work. But there is a part of flying that's involved in that, and I couldn't do it. I'm back now working at the treatment center that had saved my life in the counseling department with alcoholics and addicts. I'm making $14,000 a year, and I'm grateful for that job. I have never made such a small salary in my life, and I am grateful for that job. But I can't do the flying. <clears throat> it's going to cost ten to 20000 About that time, one of the pilots at Northwest gets a hold of me, and he said, I have a flight school that you didn't know about. I want you to come to Minnesota, live with me and my family, and go through the flight school, get the flying out of the way, and get all your tickets back for free. I went up there. I'm under 13 conditions of probation. I check out of the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I was with him for 44 days. Rained out 14 days. I never quit studying, never slowed down. Remaining 30 days, I flew 78 hours. I got four tickets back. I had two of them one morning by 11.15, and I don't think that's ever been done before. And when I'm not flying it there, I'm in not night flying, I'm in AA meetings at night because that's where I belong. That's what's given me back my life, and that's where I go. A month after I'd done all the flying and come back to Atlanta, a month, the licenses physically arrived in the mail, and I got a phone call from the head of the pilot union at Northwest. A grievance had been automatically filed because of termination. I had never activated it because I said they were fair and justified in terminating me. Based on what I did, the termination was, fire. I will, it was um, fair. I will not fight it. The pilot says to me, this is the best phone call I've ever made because he said three hours ago, John Dasberg, who is the president and CEO of Northwest Airlines, made a personal decision to bring you back and allow you to fly again. You're in stage of full flight status. <clears throat> Typically, if a pilot involves his airline in anything that's public, if the, if the airline's name is even mentioned, that's the coup de grace. That's the bullet in the head. That's the career ending. My airline was on the news 
for weeks into months. Jay Leno made his monologue off of Northwest Airlines jokes. He called me in June of 96 and apologized, by the way. It's another story. But <clears throat> I couldn't believe that John Dasberg was going to let me fly again after all that had occurred, all the publicity. And I sat there with tears flooding my cheeks. I could not stop the tears. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And when I thought about it a little further on, I thought not only is that beyond the level of extraordinary courage, what he in effect is doing is gambling his career on mine because if I go back and relapse after all the publicity I've had, alcoholic in the headlines, convicted felon, if I do it a second time, the board of directors will boot him for allowing me to do it a second time. He's gambling his career on mine and taking one hell of a chance. I got to know him pretty well, and we talked about that. I said, I would never have done that. If I had been you, I would never have done that, based on the percentages and the risk value of bringing me back. So I went back. I was never to be a captain again. Northwest now had a program for alcoholic pilots because they'd taken a beating over my incident, and I'm part of that program. My dedication, every time I put that uniform on, was that John Dasberg would never have an ounce of regret about his decision to bring me back. I already had a reputation as a good aviator. I'd always had that. But now I wanted to be the best employee on the entire property. I was certainly the most visible. And so I, I dedicated myself to that. As I was coming up on my last year at Northwest, I was speaking at United Airlines. Barbara was with me. Late at night, I get a phone call. Same pilot. And he said, John Dasberg's just changed your back-to-work agreement. He knows you're coming up on your final year at Northwest before you retire. He wants you to spend your last year in the left seat of a 747 as a captain. I sat there and I thought, every time I think God has used up his miracles, he can show me one more. I thought nothing will ever eclipse my return to Northwest, and this does it. I went back and I checked out, and I spent the last year in a 747 left seat as a captain, flying all over the world, fully trusted with 18 flight attendants, 400 people, passengers, not because I'm anybody special because John Dasberg knows that I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> we never recovered the financial disaster that we experienced. We never recovered that. It's forever gone, but I wouldn't trade that for what I've got today. I retired honorably at the age of 60 in September 98, and within about two days, my attorney called me. And he said, I just had a phone call from Judge Rosenbaum. This is now eight years after the trial. He said, in 16 years, he has never supported a petition for pardon. But if you want to make the attempt, he will support yours. And I had never considered such a thing. The judge wrote an emotional three-page affidavit that even to this day, after reading it many times, I cannot get all the way to page three without tearing up. The things that this man says about me. The man who sat on the bench for three weeks, tried me, sentenced me, and sent me to prison, does these amazing things about me as a human being. Paperwork went in, and two years later I came walking in, and there were eight phone calls telling me, phone messages telling me I had just received a presidential pardon. I cannot believe that's mega huge. I'd rather have that than win the lottery, the mega ball lottery. Powerball lottery. It changes life for a federal felony conviction. It completely changes everything. On day two of treatment, I'm in a treatment, I'm in an outside A meeting, and I perk up a little bit because I'm reading the promises, and I'm thinking, I wonder if there's anything to this. Why would they do this? Maybe, maybe they're meaningful. And I perk up a little bit, and then it says, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, I thought, okay, that lets me. I'm going way too far. I'm going down. It may work for you, and it may work for you, but I will. It will never happen for me. And I'm telling you, as I finish this thing up here, you haven't even heard 30% of the entire story in the list of miracles. I want to close right now with something that, that I like because I think it addresses and speaks to life as I have come to understand it. And it just simply says this, I do not wish you joys without a sorrow, nor endless day without the healing dark, nor brilliant sun without the restful shadow, nor tides that never turn against your bark. I wish you strength, faith, and love and wisdom, and gold and goods, gold enough to help some needy one. I wish you songs, but also blessed silence. 
in God's sweet peace when every day is done. My Comanche name is Yetzit the Nup. But you know me as Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic, and I thank you for having me here at this wonderful conference in Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.